I know you don't usually hear from me on a Wednesday, but here I am because I've got some very exciting news. Da, da, da. Pause for dramatic sound effect. Today sees the launch of a crowdfunding project that I hope you're going to get as excited about as I am. It's for Legends of the Leaf. What's Legends of the Leaf? Well, it's a book about houseplants that I want to write, but I need your help. I am launching a crowdfunding appeal on the publisher Unbound, and they specialise in crowdfunding books in a particular way so that the power is in your hands. You decide whether the book gets published by pledging the books that you like. Intrigued? Check out the link in the show notes for my Unbound page if you want more details on how this works. But let me tell you a bit first about the book. It's called Legends of the Leaf, and the subtitle is The Story Behind 25 Iconic Houseplants and the Secrets to Making Them Thrive. Does that sound like something that's going to float your boat? I hope so. It is a book that's been in my mind for a very long time, well over a year, in fact. And the book's going to consist of 25 profiles of the iconic species that we've all come to know and love. The list of plants I'm going to cover hasn't quite been finalised yet, but you can be sure it's going to contain uh, many of your favourites, including things like the maidenhair fern, string of hearts, string of pearls, hoya linearis, all those plants which we all want to have and love, but sometimes aren't quite sure how to look after. And I'm I'm going to give really well-researched care advice for these plants. It's going to be based on really, really good information. And alongside that, there will also be the stories behind those plants, where they live in their native homes, how they grow there, how they're used by the people who live there, and how they arrived in our homes. It's going to be a really rich story that will be fascinating and engaging and hopefully full of practical advice too. In other words, a kind of book form of what you get in On The Ledge podcast. It's also going to be a very, very beautiful book with 25 original full colour illustrations by the wonderful illustrator Helen Entwistle, aka Memo Illustration. I'll put a link to her work in the show notes. It's going to be 45,000 words long, hardback. It's going to be gorgeous. How do you get your hands on a copy? Well, the book won't be made until I get 100% of my publishing target. So it's really vital that if you want this book to happen, that you make a pledge. You can choose between different pledge levels. You can opt for an ebook version, a signed edition. You can get a book club edition, which gives you 10 hardback copies. You can get your name in the back of the book. There's loads of different options and I will be adding new pledge levels as time goes by. So do go and check out the Unbound website for my Legends of the Leaf page. It's unbound.com forward slash books forward slash legends dash of dash the dash leaf. If you can't remember that, just check the show notes and the link will be there. For a lot of us, this might be an unfamiliar model for publishing a book. If you do have any questions, do get in touch. I'll also put a link in the show notes to the Unbound support page for people who want to pledge, which has got loads of really good information and answers most of the questions that you might have. I'll also be planning to do a Facebook Live about uh, the book, and I'll put out the date of that as soon as I can. It'll hopefully be on a Saturday when as many people as possible can make it. But for now, I'm going to leave you with some words I put together as a kind of a genesis story for this book. It's on my project synopsis page on Unbound, and you can look at it there. But I thought you might like to hear how this book came about. Where it all began, an introduction to Legends of the Leaf. When did you first get into plants? Visitors to my home often ask, usually while struggling to disentangle a trailing vine from their hair. The simple answer is, I can't remember when plants weren't a source of constant curiosity and satisfaction in my life. Many people seem to latch onto plants when they move into their first home. 
Before that, foliage of all kinds is often just a blur of greenery that means very little to them. Yet, I've always had plants in sharp focus. I call it wearing my plant glasses. No wispy weed growing in the pavement, no pelagonium peeking from under a net curtain, no climber romping over a fence is too insignificant to escape my glance. As a small child, I remember sowing parsley seeds in the bed under the kitchen window. I must have been quite young at the time, as I came back an hour or so later to see if they'd sprouted. I sucked the sugary nectar from the flowers of the London Pride that grew by our tiny pond, and stroked fat bumblebees as they fumbled around in the ranks of African marigolds in the front garden. But my heart really lay with houseplants. I was born in the 1970s, a period when indoor gardening was undergoing a renaissance. My parents grew prayer plants in a copper fish poacher and brought back Thai trees from foreign package holidays. A cylinder of seemingly dead trunk stuck to a card that sprouted into life when stuck in water. I started to build my own plant collection, using my pocket money to buy fat-bodied cacti that produced sudden and spectacular flowers that made me gasp, fleshy succulents that performed the wondrous trick of growing baby plants along their leaf edges, and softly hairy African violets glowing with pink or purple blooms. Searching for the roots of my houseplant obsession takes me back to primary school. Next door to my classroom was a grimy conservatory full of towering cacti and a library draped in yellowing spider plants festooned with babies. My friend Ruth and I must have shown some kind of flair for horticulture, or at least a passing interest as we were let out of maths lessons to water the spider plants back to life. It may have stunted my understanding of arithmetic, but it did set me up for a lifetime of love for gardening. In turn, the spider plants responded to our care by producing many babies at the end of long stalks I later learned to call inflorescences. That and many other houseplant facts I learned from my Bible back then, The Houseplant Expert by Dr. David Hesseon, published in 1980. This is a book that remains a world bestseller to this day. I pored over its pages, circling plants I wanted to add to my collection. I still have that book now, and it doesn't feel like too much of an exaggeration to say holding this book in my hands feels like a portal to take me back into my own childhood. I still frequently search through its dog-eared pages in search of a particular plant whose name is eluding me. Forty years on, and houseplants, for many years resigned to the attic of interior design history along with antimacassars and hat stands, are suddenly and spectacularly popular once more. The distinctive leaves of the Swiss cheese plant, the purple shamrock and the pancake plant are all over Instagram, snake plants are on sale everywhere from Urban Outfitters to Tesco, and being called a crazy plant lady is a compliment, not a slur. Many other books on houseplants have been published since Dr. Hussein's The Houseplant Expert, covering every aspect from propagation to styling. And yet most of them remain silent on the matter of where houseplants actually come from, and how they found their way into our homes. Why does this matter? Discovering more about the native homes of the plants we love fills in a rich backstory that links our specimens to history, culture, botany and horticulture. More than that, it deepens our understanding of their needs. If you know, for instance, that the string of pearls grows in dry Karoo scrub regions of southwest Africa as a spreading mat on rock ledges, this gives you a hint as to why your plant isn't so chipper living in a pot of peace-based compost. The roots are used to subsisting on very little water, and what moisture there is drains away immediately. And those leaves, why round? Moisture is scarce, so the plant has evolved to reduce water loss by minimising the surface area of the leaf. If you've ever wondered about the darker stripe on the plant's pea-like leaves, these are leaf windows which help to control its exposure to the sun. I hope that after reading this book, you'll look at your plants in a different way with renewed respect, deeper insight, and an even greater passion for their incredible stories. The crowdfunder has been live for less than half a day, and I've already got some fabulous pledges from listeners. So thank you to all of those of you who've really jumped on this quickly and already pledged their support. But there is plenty of time still to make a commitment and I would love to have your backing. As ever, it's all about you. You are the people that make this houseplant magic happen. So I salute you all. And I will see you again on Friday for part two of Potting Mix Ingredients. Bye.
The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops and Fire Tree by Axel Tree. Both tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. See my show notes for details.